Hi everyone, I'm Mike Novogratz and this is Next with Novo. Mike, through your decades of financial career, you've seen many business cycles. You've seen the bond markets, you've seen the Japanese cycle, you've seen the tech crunch. How is the crypto cycle different or the same? What, do you, what, what are your sort of observations on that? Well, well, first of all, thanks for being here. I, I tweeted that if my third grade art teacher knew that I was on stage at Christie, she'd probably throw up. <laughs> um, and so it's a, it's a great honor because it'll give me bragging rights for a long time when I'm back at high school. Um, listen, we're in a really unique time in the world. Uh, COVID, it was before COVID actually, when Donald Trump passed this giant tax cut. And he passed it, if you think about it, when we had the greatest economy of all time. Uh, and so fiscal discipline kind of went out the window. When COVID happened, the response was, we need more. So we need more money. We need to take care of people. And the 30 years, you know, from 30 years back, we've seen the rich poor gap get wider and wider. And so there's a progressive mandate to say, hey, we need to do something about this, right? And so all the politics line up right now to say, we've got to spend more. Well, money doesn't grow on trees. And so what is a Federal Reserve, a central bank pushing money into the system, literally like feeding a uh, foie gras, you know, <laughs> feeding the goat, the, the, uh, the bird, uh, in, the goose, the goose. There we got it. They got it. We just keep shoving money into the system. The money's finding its way into to assets. And so we're at one of the most amazing asset bubbles we've ever seen. There's an asset bubble in bonds, right? You look at 30 year bonds, they don't give you any yield and they're rallying today. 10 year bonds are now like 130. You're like, I can lend money for 10 years. I get 1% a year. That doesn't seem great. Uh, but there's a gigantic bond bubble, right? $15 trillion of fixed income securities around the world trade at negative rates. Like who wants to give your money for negative? Uh, stocks keep going higher and higher. Art has had a great rally. Real estate, hard assets, and crypto. So crypto became a hard asset. What do I say became a hard asset, right? Crypto's new. It's 13 years ago, Bitcoin got started. And it got started with a really you know, small group of people that said, the system sucks, and I want to change the system. I don't trust it. I don't trust people in the center. It came out of the financial crises. And so that system grew. It grew for a lot of reasons because it resonated with people, right? It was a middle finger to the system. There were cypherpunks, libertarians who just didn't trust the government. Um, there were prosthesizers who said, hey, this technology is better. It's transparent. It's egalitarian. It's fair. Uh, and so it drew, drew lots of young people in. Mm -hmm. right? Young people are looking around the world and say, hey, grandpa or dad, you screwed up. You left us a polluted planet. And worst of all, you left us a terrible you know, checking account. <laughs> We've got this huge debt to pay. And so Gen Z, millennials, all migrating to this crypto world. And so we had this big bubble in 2017, which crashed. Uh, but you've got a resurgence of the enthusiasm as infrastructure got built, as more and more smart people came in. It's all part of this super cycle of really, really easy money. Mm -hmm. And so that's a long-winded answer. Got it. Do you, do you see, on just to build on that, I think that's a great analogy, do you see any parallels with sort of the, the rise and growth of the internet? Because I see this... There are some things where blockchain today is like the internet of the 90s, where some people know how to use it, but most others don't really know how to use it. And as the browser came along, things just grew quickly. Do so, you see anything there? Listen, bubbles always happen around things that fundamentally change the world mm -hmm. and change the way we live. So the railroad bubble happened way before people were all taking trains. I remember in March of 2000, I bought the best MP three player you could buy. I was, I was running, I was gonna run a race in Africa across the Sahara, six marathons in six days uh, when I was a little younger. And I wanted to listen to music and they were like, wow, I got nine songs that I heard over and over and over again. <laughs> and I remember the guy telling me, in seven years, you'll be able to buy one of these things that'll have every song ever recorded on it. And I was like, no way, no way. But remember, 1999, the stock market was at a high. Mm -hmm. And so, we had a crypto bubble in 2017, not because crypto was, was 
you know, not a good idea. We had it because it's a revolutionary idea that's going to change the way financial systems are, are built and consumer systems are built, how IP is protected. And so those idea, the idea is so big that we had one bubble. We're, we're in the midst of reflating and creating a real industry mm -hmm. with real human capital moving in. Uh, and so, yeah, the Internet's a good example. It, mm -hmm. it, it took six years to get the iPhone and, you know, Facebook, mm -hmm. right, 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, seven, eight years yeah. pre-crash. Pre and so, but we're going to see that same adoption. Got it. Last, last finance question, because I've been waiting to ask this one after listening to all of your podcasts. Uh, so fine art, which is a lot of the community here, has often been seen as a hedge against inflation, right? You're buying fine art. Some people say it will protect your assets in the inflationary cycle. NFTs, on the other hand, have had quite a volatile past, right? How do we compare and contrast this? Is NFTs... You can't... You, we're not the same category yet, right? Mm -hmm. Like, NFTs are not even first graders. We're like, we're, we're, we're preschool. Uh, we're at the dawn of this new age. It's an awesome age. Uh, I am so positive in 10 years, the NFT space is going to be so much bigger than most people think it is, right? It's going to sh show up everywhere. Your healthcare records will be NFTs uh, as a start. But every brand, every, every uh, you know, fashion brand, mm -hmm. anyone who owns IP, mm -hmm. the music industry, the creative mm -hmm. industry is going to figure out ways uh, to use this technology to, mm -hmm. to build community, to grow community, uh, and to profit. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and for that to happen, as you at Galaxy, as you're making investments, as you're looking at portfolio companies, what are some of the technologies out there that are just starting off that you're excited about that you think will enable some of this innovation? Well, listen, so we have a, we have a great investing team that focuses just on what we call the metaverse. It's called Galaxy Interactive. Sam Engelbart out there somewhere, you can raise your hand, uh, and Richard Kim. Um, and so these guys got, were way ahead of this you know, journey, thinking this thesis would work. And it's been this cross between the gaming industry, right? Because game, gamers were way ahead of this, and the IP world, and the blockchain world. So what Bitcoin did, I, I used to get asked all the time to talk about Bitcoin. I was like, oh my God, I'm not a computer scientist. Like, how do I stand in front of a crowd and not be petrified that someone's going to ask me some question about like the Persian general's problem or... Uh, <laughs> Are you Nakamoto? And, yeah. <laughs> but I, I boil it down to something really simple. The, the breakthrough of Bitcoin was it was the first digital technology, digital signature you couldn't counterfeit. And so what does that mean? Before that, you could just copy-paste. And so if you believe that you had the first digital signature you couldn't counterfeit, you could have digital art that you can't counterfeit. And so artists could all of a sudden say, hey, I'll take the time to build on, you know, uh, digital art because it's going to actually be worth more because there's scarcity. And so that, it's that kernel of innovation that's spawning this whole thing. And so we've looked at, you know, protocol levels. It's a battle on protocol level. My real bias is the Ethereum blockchain will be where most NFTs live because it's got the network effects. But, you know, there's people I'm sure out in the audience from, from Dapper who've got the flow blockchain who will probably want to punch me. Uh, there's level two chains. We've invested in many. Um, that'll be, work on top of these things until Ethereum speeds up. And so it gets wonky. But for us, having lots of bets in that space makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, this is still a creative business, right? The technology will be the platform, but it's the creativity which is going to pull people in. Who can build community, mm -hmm. right? NFTs are about building community. The ones that will succeed get people that care. And so I'm sure a lot of the speakers already talked about that. And so we're looking for entrepreneurs that know how to build community, that can build product that people want. Uh, and so, you know, from from sports, you know, you're going to see Scott Lowen up here later on talking about candy, which is an investment we made that's doing collectibles and sports. Uh, I see John from Mythical out there uh, who already spoke, maybe, no. who's up next, right, who's building this amazing game ecosystem uh, called Blancos and lots of other things. They'll compete. Like, so for us, we're spreading our bets. We're cheering them all on. I'm positive like I said, this is the first out of the first inning. Mm -hmm. And so 
one of the reasons we're not sure where this is going is because the displays, right? You, you buy a Beeple for $69 million. Congratulations, that was a hell of a sale. <laughs> um, and Teamwork. if I buy a big piece of art, I want to bring it home, put it on my wall, and show it off to my friends, right? There's not even great physical displays yet for, for NFTs. The metaverse isn't built yet. It's just starting, and you know, through Sam and Richard, I see a lot of the cool projects that are coming. Uh, but they're in the first inning, too. And so two, three, four years, you're going to go online or you're going to have these really cool AR glasses. You guys don't notice these, but these are, they're not AR glasses, but they're going to be AR glasses. <laughs> and I'm going to put them on and, and my friend Mel's red jacket's going to actually be like, you know, NFT Gucci. Um, and so we don't really have the displays yet, how we're going to interact and so this is really like the building blocks. And so when we think of investing, we're investing in a lot of projects. We're spreading our bets. We're investing in architecture. Uh, I haven't bought a whole lot of NFTs. You know, I thought, well, this is a bubble. Like the, the, just like there was a bubble in 2017 in the internet, there was a bubble. People, 69 million. I could have spent that 69 million on other art. And I would bet in five years it was going to be worth more. And I met people. I love the guy. And I think he actually is an amazing artist. It just 5,000 days wasn't worth $69 million relative to everything else at that time. And so that, that, that's coming down. I think his, his work is down like 90, 90%. And so the fluff came out. Yeah, 90%, just, just saying. Hey, uh, the fluff I've came out. It. It, doesn't, it doesn't mean by any stretch that this space is less relevant. It's quite frankly more relevant. Spaces get relevant because smart people move into the space. And we are seeing more and more creators, more and more brands, more and more developers rushing into the space. And when human capital comes, great product comes. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great segue to one of the topics because we've been talking about technology and businesses and investments that you're making. But on the other side, the the point that you brought up, collectors, who are a lot of people in this crowd, don't quite have all the tools that you have, for example, to understand this market. Where should they start? Like, I think collectors should crawl, walk, run, right? You know, there's three or four kind of mainstream artists that have moved into, into the space. I, I did a podcast with Urs Fisher, uh, who's now sold 10 NFTs at about $80,000 each. And they're really cool. Writers, his first NFT was an egg with a big lighter in it. He loves combining objects. And I thought, if I bought that Urs Fisher egg, eh, where would I show it? I'd show people on my phone, maybe take an Instagram picture, put it on a Samsung frame TV. But in the future, I'm going to wear it on my shoulder like a piece of jewelry. I'm going to walk down the street, and anyone who's got the glasses are going to be like, dude, he's got the Urs Fisher egg. Uh, or I'll hide it in the refrigerator so my wife gets spooked. <laughs> Um, you know, and so, like, I do think because Urs is a creative genius, like his big sculptures, I'm looking at a sculpture, and I was like, $4 million, I should have bought the NFT, <laughs> right? He, he sells at real prices. I don't know if his strategy of doing lots of NFTs and just selling them because he's a genius is going to work. I was out with an artist, an equally renowned artist last night, uh, who was going to announce a project Monday. And it was really cool because he was using the spirit of the community. Right, gamifying things. He's going to sell 3,000 parts that you put together the parts to make 1,000 objects. And once you make the objects, uh, you can hit a button and a physical rendition gets made and then blown up. And you know, then you get it sent with a video of it blowing up and there's your piece of art. Like that's authentic to the crypto, to the NFT community, right? This gamification, this collecting piece, it's authentic to the physical art community. And so I actually think that's got a better chance of retaining value over the long haul. But I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm making the same guess as you're making, right? Damien Hurst came out with his project, I think, yesterday or two days ago, which is kind of a vote, right? You buy this NFT and then you vote. Do I keep the NFT or do I get the physical version? And so, well, no, I think he's, it's 10,000 of them or 1,000, one of the two. And so a year from now, we'll know what people thought. Do they want the, the NFT or do they want the physical? Uh, and so, listen, I give these guys credit because if you're Urs Fisher or Damian Hurst or Murakami, it takes a lot of courage to go out and take your brand and put it into this completely first grade, you know, gig. But that's how we're going to learn. 
what works. Broadly, the community has loved the digital native stuff, right? The generative art stuff, right? Uh, Alexei Cherniak's got his, uh, his project. Uh, that's fascinating to me. That's where the intellectual capital of our generation, right? It's AI plus artistic talent. You know, when you, you think about it, it's Saul LeWitt 30 years ago. 30 years ago? I don't know. My art history is not great. Doing algorithmic art, and now we've got it happening in, in real time in NFTs. And so that community is hyper-focused, right? It's hyper-passionate. And so buying his stuff probably, if I had a guess, retains value and appreciates more than the famous artists. The famous, I put quotes around that. Got it. See, again, this is very, very fascinating. And people otherwise would have not known your thoughts on this. I think education is a big component to this, right? You mentioned crawl, walk, run. What is sort of, you spend a lot of time producing content with your blog, with your sort of video series podcast. What is the sort of next step here? Like how are you and Galaxy going to educate the commonplace consumer because everyone else is going to lose the shirt on their back if they don't invest properly or think properly. What is your take on, on building ed education material for them? Yeah, I think it's really an interesting point. We, we talk about it, you know, on Candy, and Scott's going to come up here and talk about it, uh, has a deal with Major League Baseball to kind of roll out the baseball product. And if any of you were paying any attention, like when NBA Top Shop came out, it was the the thing. Mm -hmm. And it was a craze. And I remember talking to the leagues, making my pitch, saying, you know, you got to be careful because if you burn all those fans by people paying way too much, mm -hmm. you might turn them off as long-term mm -hmm. fans of yours, let alone collectors. And so there's always that. Listen, it's not anyone's fault that there's like these tempest in a teapot hyper excitements that happen. You're seeing it right now with uh, these... They're almost like little Pokemons. Uh, why can't I think of the name? Um, yes, uh, <laughs> Axie Infinities, right? The little Axies. Thank they look you. like Pokemons, but they're fish. Uh, you buy them for $500. Once you own it, you kind of play a game. You earn points in the game. Those points are worth money. And it's taken Southeast Asia by storm. They did $31 million last night of turnover. Right? The next biggest NFT did $2 million last night of turnover. And so Axie Infinity is the hottest token in the world. Will they be able to sustain that? We'll see. But you got to be a little bit careful of buying into those frenzies because it often turns people off. So if it's your brand, mm -hmm. if your brand is Major League Baseball, if your brand is Levi Strauss or whatever these fancy shoes I have on, um, you know, taking your customers on a journey to create community and to link them into you is more important than the short-term up and down of price. Mm -hmm. um, we try to give people advice as investors. We try to give our, our companies we invest in the best advice we can. They make their own decisions. Um, but I really think you want, you, I always say you don't want to be first. <laughs> you know, you want to be second. Let the other guy make the mistake first. It's a crawl, walk, run approach. Mm -hmm. And so as investors, like, it didn't take a genius to say $69 million is probably not going to last for people. Now, there was PR involved in buying that. There was excitement. There was, you know, two guys having an ego battle, like always have in art. Um, but I would look for more sustainability, and sustainability is community. Got it. Again, that's the beauty or pain of the auction world, right? The competition can oh, take the beautiful. prices wherever it can go. Uh, building on your last point, are there sort of thoughts that you have around sort of tools that allow people to manage their portfolios better in this NFT space, right? Because in the traditional land, you managed your portfolio in like Fidelity or Schwab or wherever a common investor did, is Galaxy building tools where I can bring my NFT from from DARP, uh, Dapper Labs and from uh, OpenSea and everywhere into one place. Is there something like that that's coming out? So we're not building it. We're investing in lots yep. of companies that are doing these things. And, and that's probably one step beyond my pay grade. I'm sure Sam could answer the question. It, what's going to happen intuitively is there are going to be a couple big marketplaces where things migrate to. Right? Liquidity usually migrates to, to broader marketplaces. And I don't know if it's OpenSea or Nifty or, or, or one not built yet. Um, like I said earlier, I think you're going to have to be Ethereum, you know, because if I build something, I want it to be able to use somewhere else. So if, if Scott at Candy builds a 
digital bobblehead, it might want to be s sold in, you know, green, green, green seas, green, green. Green Park. Green Park. Green Park is building stadiums, like virtual stadiums, for people to participate and watch games and go to go to the stadium and watch the Dodgers play. Maybe that bobblehead will get be sold be sold in their uh, virtual, you know, game shop, uh, as opposed to just on the Candy website. And so you're going to see this interactivity, the compo composability, which makes this whole technology so awesome. I mean. Same thing in the DeFi space. So think of it this way. When Apple came up with the iPhone, right, they were smart enough to put a camera and then a GPS on it. So once they had that GPS, all of a sudden Uber was possible, hmm. right? Uber didn't thank Apple. They were like, dude, well, they thanked him because they have to pay that goddamn fee. Uh, but we're building these platforms that you can build on top of, and that's what makes the the blockchain revolution is so spectacular. It's why I'm positive uh, in decentralized finance is going to win because it's a better product and it's going to have all this creative input that gets built on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to see the same thing in NFTs. Yeah, no, I think it's a fascinating point. I think for folks, the, the art market doubled between 2008 and 2018. The iPhone was one of the biggest contributors. We don't give it credit because communication became so much easier. You could take pictures. There was Instagram. I think blockchain is another one of those zero through ones that could take us, I think NFT specifically, could take us there. Uh, you think about like art. I was never a big art buyer, and then I started a couple of small art collections because I'm building an art park. And so I'm a complete novice in art, but I was learning. I was like, well... How does art get valued? It's not democratic, right? How many people in the world can afford a Picasso? Probably less than 10,000, uh, maybe even less than that. And so it's this collection of people saying it's valuable. It's the, the gallerist, it's the, the auction house, it's the museums, it's this people, it's a community of people. Mm -hmm. We used to think as a middle class kid, oh, those are snotty people, um, right? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not, that's not my world. Right, that, that, but so you have these elite communities or small communities that care about something passionately, and that's create value. I say it's valuable. You say it's valuable. Therefore, it's valuable. What the internet has done, and what this technology has done, it allows us to create communities so much faster and so much bigger, in all kinds of weird places. Mm -hmm. The tennis shoe community is a people have a desire to collect. Right, we're collectors in our DNA. And you're able to tap into broader communities so much faster. Uh, it's not going to be one homogenous community. Like people that love tennis shoes might love virtual tennis shoes, or they might not. Uh, but there'll be maybe different people than love, you know, jewelry. Uh, but this ability, mm -hmm. this communication ability, brings more people. More people, more demand, higher price. Yep. No, fascinating. And I think you're so right. You know how to dumb it down for all of us. So well, well done there. Uh, which is, leads me to one of the questions I've been sort of dying to ask you as part of this thing, since you mentioned collecting. What is one of the best, like, more, most favorite thing you've bought, both traditional and digital or NFT, in the last six months? I bought a Sam Gilliam drape. Mm -hmm. Sam Gilliam is an African-American artist who... It's just awesome. And there was this museum that was like going bankrupt down in North Carolina. And uh, we paid a lot for their drapes, so they didn't go bankrupt. And it's one of these things that's so nice that it shouldn't be in my house. It'll, and it'll probably go and give it to a museum at one point because it's just this spectacular piece of art. And so I walk by and feel privileged. I'm like, now what the problem is when I have parties, I have to hire people to stand in front of it so people don't <laughs> splash wine on it. <laughs> you know, the NFT thing's interesting because... I keep, be, keep being given NFTs of myself, which is very strange. <laughs> I don't like any of them yet, but I'm getting painted by this woman, Alexa Mead, who paints people, has them moves, and creates NFTs out of it. And so next week, that'll be my favorite NFT. I'm going <laughs> to diet for a week. I'm going to do push-ups. Uh, she did Ariana Grande, and it looks spectacular. You can Google her. And she's, she's a really cool lady and a cool artist, and so... I think that's going to be my favorite NFT. <laughs> Great, seeing into the future. A little narcissism is always good. <laughs> you don't need to do push-ups. You, your, your wrestling days haven't passed yet. Uh, which sort of bring, brings me to one of sort of the last segment of this 
please. This is more of the, the mic show. Like, where is this going 10 years? Like, what, you mentioned a little about AR glasses and innovation around display technology that makes it easier to consume. You talked about creation. You talked about financial instruments. All packaged up into one. What is Mike Novogratz's future of this world in the next, like, by 2030, what are you going to tell us? Oh, God, that's a hard question. I, I used to always watch Blade Runner and watch it over and over and over again. <laughs> And I mean, listen, if I step back and not just NFTs, I do worry about the world that we're going into this Blade Runner-esque where we're going to have part of the world lives in this fantastic space, right? Where we've got NFTs and virtual worlds and uh, and part of the world. I mean, Kinshasa Zaire, Zaire doesn't have electricity for 5 million people. And you're like, oh my God, like, and even within our own country, this, this gap between people who have the access. And so I worry that, the world looks more like Blade Runner. Uh, on the more optimistic side, if you're on the good side of the Blade Runner, uh, <laughs> it, you know, it is going to be fantastic. We are going to change the way finance is done, right? You're going to move from having a bank account to a wallet on your phone. Uh, I think in the long run, that's actually progressive and democratic. Uh, it cuts out a lot of the rent takers. I think you're going to see a shift of power from the businessman to the creator, uh, right? We never had the ability to monetize community, to monetize this, this creative stuff that we do today. Mm -hmm. um, simple things like, I was talking about the, 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 the artist who's gonna do his drop. He's gonna give away 80% of the, uh, or 70% of the, the NFTs, but each time one sells, he's gonna get 10% mm -hmm. in perpetuity, right? So many artists uh, have see their painting sell at Christie's for, Six million, eight million, thirty million, and get nothing because they sold the thing years ago for mm -hmm. for very little. And so, the tools and the mindset, right? This is not just a, the tools enabling, but it's a mindset of where the the value should get split is shifting really quickly. And so, I think you're gonna, you know, if I well, I do have four kids, <laughs> you know, I the creative stuff I think is going to be a lot more valuable relative than it ever was. Got it. Uh, I think one of the things in there you mentioned is around sort of taking power away from certain individuals and giving it to certain other individuals. I think governments have a, a place there, right? You used to advise the Fed. The Fed has two mandates, full employment and money supply. This money supply goes away from them. What, what is their job? And how does the art regulation play a part in this? So I don't think in 10 years' time, or at least I pray, I literally pray in 10 years' time, we're not using Bitcoin to buy shoes, um, right? People are buying crypto because they're worried about a slow debasement of fiat money, especially in the U.S. Uh, if we were worried about a fast debasement, we're all screwed, right? Because then it looks like Venezuela. It looks like Weimar Germany. It looks like... And then you have complete breakdown of the social contract. You have social unrest. You have war. Uh, and so none of us should be praying that Bitcoin replaces the dollar. It should be a bigger and bigger percentage of your savings, maybe, if you believe it's going to continue to appreciate as a store of wealth. Just like, I mean, there's lots of stores of wealth. You have art, you have real estate. I've bought a lot of real estate recently. Um, you, you know, you have equities. There, and so I don't think this is an all or nothing bet. Mm -hmm. um, I really do think that within 10 years, the stewards of our economy are not that bad. <laughs> you know, I worry it's going to be harder to land the plane, uh, right? We have deficits like we've never seen, and there's a political environment that wants to keep spending. Um, but that's what we watch for all the time. And if we lose confidence, if you see what is called the Minsky moment in economics, where confidence just goes, and you'll feel it, well, then all bets are off. Then we might live in a, a barter society, and we'll be bartering with Bitcoin. But it's not my base case, and it's certainly not what I hope for. Um, when I think about the world, right, Bitcoin's important for the U.S., but it's wildly important in places like Venezuela or Nigeria or where there's a constant depreciation of their currency and your savings as a middle-class person or as a working class person just get eaten away. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a, interesting because crypto is the first global thing. Like, we don't have... We have a U.S. bond market, a European bond market, and now with DeFi, you're having a global bond market with mm -hmm. places like Compound or Aave. Mm -hmm. uh, and so 
it's going to be interesting to see how it all fits together. And I wish I had the, you know, the, the crystal ball. Um, what I'm positive on is the acceleration of these systems is happening. The network effects are happening. The human capital coming in is happening. And so even though there's going to be some regulatory pushback, there will be, right? Regulators' job is to protect the little guy. Uh, they don't care about the guy that lost the $50 million on people, but they care about the guy that bought and lost money uh, on GameStop and, and, and you know, Do Dogecoin. They do. The little guy they care about. That's their job. Uh, and so you're going to see some regulation in the U.S. that's going to put some guardrails around. And I know the libertarians of crypto are like, oh, screw that. I actually don't think it's that horrible. Right. Uh, I think the moment there's a little regulatory clarity, you're going to see the institutional money pour in. Mm -hmm. And if you want to see the revolution really change things, you need the institutional money. Right. Right now, crypto collectively, add the NFT space, add all their coins in, add the public companies – is about one, 40 basis points, less than one half a percent of global wealth, right? Tiny. I fundamentally believe in three, four, five years, it'll be two, three, four, five percent of global wealth. The only way it gets there is if some of that institutional money comes in. And so you can't have it both ways. Gotcha. Uh, I'll say one word for each of these next topics, and I want to hear like what your immediate comments are. Uh, first, Elon um, <laughs> listen, I, Elon is like the entrepreneurial genius of our time, and he seems to have the maturity of a 14-year-old. Uh, <laughs> and so those, those two things, you know, aren't necessarily, they're normally not congruent, but in his case, they're congruent. And, you know, he's having fun. He's building, I'm, I'm a huge SpaceX investor and fan. I drive two Teslas. I would go in the boring tunnel if it was available here to, to get uptown. And so I, you know, I so much appreciate how he, what he does. I, I think a little dose of, and I'm, listen, I'm a fun loving guy and I'm not trying to be judgmental, but it just, certainly in the space of like the crypto space and even in the AMC space, the comments just seemed wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the reason for those who haven't been following Elon, I hope everyone has, is he, his tweets move markets, right? As, as Mike was saying, the power is shifting from some people to some other people. Elon has tremendous power to move the crypto market with just a single tweet. Second word, China. Ah, so sad. So I lived in Hong Kong for seven years, right? From 1993 to 2000, I was at Goldman Sachs. I was on the front line and thought of myself as part of this ambassadorial movement to build bridges. And in every bone of my body, I thought, it's heading in the right direction. There's this, we're not going to have the exact ethos, exact economies, but we're moving to this shared world. Uh, Chinese are being educated here. We're setting up businesses there. You know, the Schwartzman scholars at Tsinghua University were like the Rhodes scholars of the 20th century. And... It all reversed about six years ago when President Xi decided that he really liked power and wanted to be a dictator uh, or an emperor. And since then, every year it gets worse, and we're now in a Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if we should be in a Cold War. And the problem is this. China's exports, China exports about $2.8 trillion a year. That makes them the fifth largest economy in the world, fourth largest economy in the world. U.S., Japan, Germany, I'm sorry, U.S., China, Japan, Germany, China exports. That's ahead of France, Italy, India. And so it's hard to have a world where we have a, you know, no trade with China. Like it's that big already. We're that interdependent. And so we're in this really screwed up place where we both know we're really interdependent interdependent. China is twice as reliant on trade as the U.S., but we're still, we export a trillion and a half dollars. We're still interdependent, but we have this Cold War. We don't trust China anymore, both Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, and China doesn't trust us. And I don't see it getting better. What China did in Hong Kong is heartbreaking. You know, I lived there. I, the Hong Kong people was its own independent, vibrant place, and now it's not. 
And I know all my friends are slowly moving out of there or looking to move out of there. And so I'm really pessimistic. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we can back off a little bit and start rebuilding trust. But I don't think so as long as Xi's there. And Xi will be there as long as he can grow the economy at 4.5%. Because mm-hmm. the middle class in China doesn't really care that Jack Ma just got iced, right? They don't. They don't care that Didi, you know, got iced. Uh, they care as their life getting better. And he's delivered. As long as he delivers that, nothing will change. If he doesn't deliver that, then he won't be emperor for life. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a thaw. And I think from a crypto perspective as well, his take every nine months on mining. <laughs> Sometimes I forget I'm talking crypto. <laughs> yeah, yep, sorry about that. Uh, listen, I was a macro guy for 20 years, and it's kind of in my DNA. Um, China is unbelievably important in crypto liquidity because if anyone's ever lived in Asia, their gambling gene is about 10x what the American gambling gene is. They, it's just, it doesn't matter if it's China, Korea, Japan, Taiwan. They love to gamble. Uh, my wife's like, I can't believe you make those blanket statements. It's a real statement. <laughs> in Hong Kong, at Happy Valley Racetrack, on a normal Thursday night, they gamble more on those races than we do on the Kentucky Derby. They have 7 million people. We have 330 million. <laughs> we have one race a year that people care about. That's a normal Thursday night. So it's in the DNA. And so, so much of liquidity in crypto came from these Chinese exchanges. Now, I don't think it's all going to go away. The Chinese are really crafty. They know how to use VPNs better than anybody on the planet. But the Chinese government doesn't want China to play with Bitcoin or mining anymore because they're launching their own currency, the, the, the Chinese you know, digital RMB. Mm-hmm. They want to use that specifically to weaken the dollar. They're sick of dollar hegemony. And so it's one of the big political moves of the last 20 years. And the U.S. has been slow to respond, but you're going to we're going to you're going to see the U.S. respond. We're going to have a digital dollar sooner than you think, uh, and that'll be like one of the Cold War battles. See, that was the response I was looking for on China. All right. uh, I, I had a few other, few other words, but we're, we're at two, one minute thirty seven. So closing remarks. Um, closing remarks is I think you know we're at a wonderful age in some ways. Like I said, it's this tale of two cities or tale of two worlds, but if you're in this room, there's this wonderful opportunity to kind of create, to participate, to build community. Um, I love what Christie's is doing because you're taking this, what I thought was a stodgy art community. That's why I wore a conservative jacket, Um, but it doesn't seem so stodgy. But you're taking a traditional, like the biggest players in the art world and bringing technology and this new generation into the world. And I think those marriages are wildly important. Um, and so, listen, I have fun going to work every day, uh, and I'm, I think, the oldest guy in crypto, um, or at least the second oldest. Uh, and I'm optimistic. Like, again, you have to be careful that you, you know, markets are going to go up and down, but I think in five years you're going to see all this stuff, much bigger part of GDP. Excellent. Thank you once again, Mike, for taking an hour, being with us. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.